Welcome to Conversations in Connectivity. I'm Ryan Carlson, your host. This is a podcast for the IoT professionals and product leaders responsible for building, growing, executing, and at times educating others about the role that connectivity operations plays within their organization. You may not have the job title, but you've got the emotional scars to prove that you've been doing the job anyways. If learning how others are harnessing connectivity in the industries they serve you're in luck. Please consider subscribing and leaving a positive review if you find this episode valuable. Today's guest is Titu Botish, a PhD in electronics and mobile robotics, and is the CEO of Neuronic Works, the product design and manufacturing company in Canada. We discuss how connectivity shapes both the challenges and the complexity of the product design process and where most gaps often rear their ugly heads in the design process. From radio compatibility, carrier compatibility, process selection, and security, we cover tons of ground. It's clear, though, that from the design level to the system level, connected products represent a new set of technologies and capabilities that can all serve as the weakest link. I think you'll find that this conversation makes for a very helpful checklist for anybody considering a product idea that they'd want to bring to market, and it also serves as a reminder of how complex some of these decisions can be and what the value of having an expert guide alongside them might look like. This episode is brought to you by Soricom, a global connectivity service provider that believes the fastest way to cost savings and scale is when customers are in full control of their connectivity operations. Experience self-service, pay-as-you-go, global connectivity without a contract today at Soricom.io. Signing up for an operator account takes less than a minute. So now, on to the interview. How long have you been in Canada? I believe going on the 25th year now. Fantastic. And yes, indeed. Life is passing quite quick. And the, the one thing that I am very happy about is that I don't look back one second. Uh, we are so happy to be here and even so proud to call us Canadian. Uh, we are, not that I necessarily live my dream every day, uh, because yes, our life as a designer at the end of the day, even a manufacturer now has its challenges. However, yes, there are many things that we enjoy and be proud from. I want to pull on this thread just a little bit more of some reflection. Titu Bodish, CEO at Neuronic Works. You uh, have got a long CV with technical advisor, chief hardware engineer, vice president of engineering. But the thing that caught my eye was that at Polytechnic University, you've got a PhD with a doctoral thesis in 2003 for research regarding the adaptive control of autonomous mobile robots. Yes. A lot has changed since 2003. So what does T2 from 2003 think of the world of autonomous robots in 2022? Oh, that's a very loaded question. So 2003, the processors we had available at that time were 286, Intel 286, 12 megahertz. And we are trying to develop machine learning models on those processors. I remember that having models of neural networks of 100 or even 150 nodes and neurons was a record. Yeah, so, wow. Definitely, even at that time, we had the hopes up. We had the vision that this will come. Yes, being younger, seeing movies, you dream about. But I have to say that the reality in 2022 and soon enough, 2023, in many ways, it exceed our expectations, our dreams of maybe how many, 20 years ago. The capabilities, the, the power that machine learning can bring to systems in general, it sometimes, <laughs> I feel goosebumps. Uh, and that much more because it is not a dream. It is not a movie. It is a reality. With age, I learned to enjoy, to appreciate little things. So what we are capable to do right now, the machine learning on a day-to-day -day applications, for me, it's very interesting, very rewarding, and actually a confirmation to what I dreamed before. 2002 Minority Report was out. A Tom Cruise movie with the interfaces where he's moving displays around with his hands. When I bring up to people who know the movie and say, it was, that was 2002. No way. Because we see that today, the idea of LIDAR and things that are built into the small little devices that are in our pocket. 
that we have the capability to do so much today between Turing and Metcalf's laws and all of the, the mm -hmm. doublings of processors. It's interesting to be a native analog human living in a digital world. We grew up in an analog world. I remember yeah. modems, dial up and, and but getting clock. my <laughs> was, clock. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And how much things have changed. But even then, we're now living in a world, even seven to eight years ago or so, we started seeing more and more cloud-based technology. We started seeing the early Internet of Things pre-AWS IoT and Azure. And we're now in a world in which things connect to the Internet on its own. It makes decisions on its own. Machine learning is a thing that we actually accept. There's entire jobs that exist for training machine learning models. There's machines that train machine learning models, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's crazy. It is it's crazy. So you're right. I was born and I was trained in an analog world. In my university days, yes, we had some courses in microprocessors and all that, but still it was a lot of analog. But part of my happiness, one thing that makes me happy, is because I witnessed all these changes. And for a small part, we've been as a company part of these uh, changes. I remember as first after working in Canada, as a design engineer here, all the communication was wired, 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 like RS-485, RS-232, CAN came after that, Ethernet came after that, but it was all wires. And then all of a sudden, wireless, yeah, wireless, and that, that came to be. And then first, everybody was doing projects with Bluetooth. And on that note, I don't remember in the last seven, eight years to have a project that does not have some sort of connectivity. So it started with Bluetooth. Everybody was doing Bluetooth at that time, I believe because of the connectivity with the cell phones, the cell phone had a Bluetooth, so let's connect with something and use the cell phone to move data up to the cloud if necessary, if that was such a thing at that. There were only private clouds. So Bluetooth, and then people moved into Wi-Fi designs, Wi-Fi. And for the last, I want, I, they have to say four to five years, even we moved into cellular. So I moved to cellular connectivity and that opens and yet another door, another, we are step in, <laughs> referring to movies and games to another level of connectivity. And that is great. I remember when Wi-Fi and Bluetooth were the predominant way of connecting devices wirelessly and cellular was still the only way you could get a cellular connection was to buy a, like a hotspot and then you would you know, low tech, you would end up, or you'd go through the insane cost of building out your own boards that had the ability to hold a SIM, but the plans still weren't built around data. It was still, while well, you still had to provision the phone number, you <laughs> weren't going to be using any voice. You weren't yeah. using any text and the data was an afterthought. I had a Treo 650, one of the, er, those early keyboard phones when Blackberry was big. And you started thinking about like, how much data does my plan have? They didn't. Yes, indeed. It was indeed. so little. I used two megabits last month. Oh my goodness. That's a lot of little <laughs> text emails, right? So now we're in a world where you could go to a party and I've got a fun little party favor is just. So let's try and name something that's not going to be connected to the internet and we can put our cynics hat on and there's, that's a really hard question to answer. I truly believe there is no such a thing. Yep. Giving enough time, everything will be connected. Yep. And I truly believe when I say that this IOT wave, can we call it an IOT wave? And then IOT has obviously a brother, a good brother called the in, uh, industrial IOT, IOT. Yeah? So they go in parallel. I mentioned that because my background is industrial control and automation. So I believe that this wave of IOT is not near the peak. We will have a few good more years, a decade, if not more of years until you see that, yeah, we picked that wave. We have now more connected devices than not there. I don't think there is anything there that should not be connected. So with so many things that are being connected. I remember the reticence, even in the industrial internet of things, for people to connect things to the cloud. So first it was wireless is, in, is, is not secure, right? There was always this fear. And now we've got encryption, we've got protocols, we've got a variety of ways from the manufacturing level. There's now general acceptance of cloud use with private networks and virtual private networking. There's, there's 
we're, we're now, if you were thinking about like the tipping point and that crossing the chasm on one side, you have all the early adopters where people were just looking at, oh, this sounds neat and new. I want to be on the front end of that versus crossing the other side of the chasm where it is just generally accepted. I believe and have seen the conversation in the world. It's not, should we connect our device? It's when do we do it? And which one do we connect first? And then you get to go to how. And so that that's where Neuronic Works steps in. So talk to me about the start of your Neuronic Work, Neuronics Works journey as doing design, electronics, manufacturing. Tell me about that. Where do I start? That's the big question. What drove you to start it? I enjoy designing new things. And if you look at the quote unquote, the material of our people that are with us today, they enjoy that too. The power you feel that you, when you create something out of quote unquote, nothing, when you put everything together and it starts to click, blink, buzz, whatever it does, it's a great feeling. It's a creation in itself. As small as it is, or as complicated it might be, it is something that was not there before and you made it. This is the primary driving force beyond that. On a second level, I can say that I always, we try to more than 13 years ago, we start, we tried to create a new product on the market, uh, the, uh, it was electronic shelf labels. We tried to marry together two technologies that were very new at the time. It was called zero power LCDs. It was the precursor of the e-ink and then the low power RF, the 915 megahertz uh, proprietary protocols communication, and that will help change this electronic shelf labels very quick. And we came with a prototype and long story short. Nine months later, ironically, nine months later, we ran out of steam as in two engineers, a prototype, no production, no nothing, basically trying to sell that to, to big store, big chain stores like Metro and Dominion was that time and even Walmart and not getting traction. And then we look at each other now, what do we want to do? Yeah, we love design. So let's compete. Let's continue doing design. And so we started by one and two and three and more, more projects. We hire start to hire people. We created this business of design. We love the design part. It is challenging. It is not easy, but has its own rewards now and then. So the design process, I've seen it approached from multiple angles. Some people start with a significant business challenge and they work their way backwards asking how can technology meet the specific outcomes that we want? The question on the like the grocery store or the retail shelving. Today, you see it all over the place. I've got a lot, there's a lot of grocery stores in my area where they automatically have the little updating tags and the cost of labor was getting higher and higher in certain markets. And eventually they said, how do we make this go quicker? But I've also seen people, the market doesn't always know what it really wants. And sometimes it takes pushing technology to create an example that can inspire people to go that, that, that might not be exactly what I want, but think of it in this other application. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about that. If we're talking about designing hardware, solving problems, every engineer I know, what drives them is the having the opportunity to solve really cool technology challenges or software design challenges, building something neat, right? It's not the money, it's not the fame, it's getting to solve that puzzle. Indeed. And even from that first lesson that we had more than 13 years ago, we learned a major lesson. We have to be in sync with the market. You have to recognize what the market wants. You can be, it can be the coolest thing ever. If the market doesn't want it, you build it for the show only, and you don't go farther than that. And I truly believe that 13 years ago was when uh, we were ahead of the market somehow. That lesson taught us that we have to talk with the client a lot, talk a lot with our client, understand him, try to understand the market behind him and design according. But even though we do that on a daily basis, in fact, before we engage a new customer, we had about four, six, even more weeks where we just talk with them, trying to understand what they want to build. But 
even if you do that, you have to build in order to build it. You have at one point, jump in the cold water, take the chances, build something and bring it to life. And then present it to your customer, to your market. And again, receive feedback because as Ryan, as you said, clearly many times people don't know what they want. They have mm -hmm. to see it before they start to recognize the potential of the thing. So more, more often than not, you come with a prototype, come with a proof of concept on the market, then a, a most viable product, a little product, and you just basically test the waters. The idea of, and what we see make our clients, some of our clients successful is that they recognize this process. They embrace this process and they try to produce as they try to come on the market as soon as possible, test the water, so to speak, again, receive the feedback and rethink the opportunity. We've seen many times people coming to us with one idea. We produce an alpha and a beta, we go on the market, they find that, for example, even a subsection of the of first idea turned around, becomes a new product, they, they pivot, they go in a new direction and they become successful. And please let me know that, please allow me to tell you they're not less happy just because of that. They, they become successful with, with in a completely new direction. Yes, we've seen that and we are aware of that. And we try to teach and tell our customer that, that way of working. So what is that process? that consultative process look like when someone says, I have an idea, I want to build this thing. Do you have a standard set of advice that you hand over or that you give to people? What advice do you give to people when they come with they've got money, they've got timeline, they've got intent, right? Like everything that would make a salesperson salivate, but how do you pump the brakes to see that they're successful? Sometimes we go directly and you present them our product development cycle. It's a cycle, by the way. It's a process, but in the end, it's a cycle because it never stops. Holy grail of product design is that if you do it properly and you launch the product, you receive feedback and you go again for version two, version three, the whole process becomes a cycle, becomes a pinwheel that can maintain itself. So how do we go? And we really open our books, so to speak, teaching books, and we present to them the path for product development and we show them how stages are followed one after the other. We try to explain to them that why we do that, why we have the stages, why at each, each and every, after each and every stage, we have a gate that somebody has to validate himself as an innovator or the market at large. So we have this process with stages, with gates, and what we try to achieve is to go for this fall often, fall quick and pivot if necessary, such that they do not waste a lot of money. The worst thing one can do is to become enclosed, sitting in between four walls with these ideas, pumping a lot of energy and resource into it to become a product on the market, go there, I've done that, and go there and then there is no traction for it. The best thing to do is to show results involve people, suppliers, manufacturers, customers, especially, and find feedback. Is it a viable, if it is a viable product? It is an iter iter iterative process that I try, I'm trying to say here, and is something that we learned even the hard way for the last 13 years and more. It's the most expensive way to prove your point, to go out and just build the thing and sit in your own echo chamber. And yes. I mean, we've seen it over and over again. I remember working on a maritime, it was a project for, that was a piece of hardware, connected hardware that would be used in maritime applications. And the initial ask that they came to us was saying, we want to build an app. This is what we think people want. We want this app to perform these particular functions within a maritime vessel. And we said, that sounds great. How about we go and we talk to ship builders, ships, captains, and some of the people within the channel that service these maritime vessels working on these specific aspects of a ship. And that took two weeks. And this is one of those things where you have to slow down to speed up. And the reports that came back is there was not a single bit of feedback that validated anyone wanting to have 
an app. Nobody wanted it. But what we ended up walking away with was understanding where their real challengers were when they were coming into port, when they were out at sea, and identified a number of things and ended up going a completely separate direction. We, we found out where their frustration came with, how to, we, I think we ended up reducing an average of something like three dozen helicopter service trips a year. Three dozen and a helicopter trip to bring the parts that you need for a mission critical component within ship out at sea is a significant amount of money, especially when it's under service contracts and where some of these people are under certain constraints. You never would find out how to make those leaps without stopping, pumping the brakes and asking why a lot, right? We're seeing lots of connected products going out into the world. You're already getting people to think about that flywheel or the, that process. It's not just a waterfall genius design, but creating that, that feedback loop. We're now moving beyond people, again, as we said earlier, asking why IoT. Of course, we're going to connect our thing. Now that people are actually connecting their stuff, they're even finding ways of monetizing their connected products. There's a whole new set of constraints to where companies are starting to internalize their ability to build and maintain these connected products. So if I said connectivity operations, what does that make you think? That'll be a bit of a long answer. So please bear with me here and please remember that everything I'm answering today is obviously from the perspective of a designer. Yeah. Yes. So internet of things and his brother, as I said, uh, industrial IOT has brought us into a connectivity, an age of connectivity that will enable machines and systems and objects to talk to each other to function in new and expanded ways. Uh, we, we saw that, and that is the thing that brings us towards this new age. So we see now machines, objects, communicate with each other continuously, forming large integrated systems capable of creating and communicating and aggregating, analyzing and acting uh, on data. The connectivity adds to the design process an additional layer of complexity and with that, a new set of challenges. Actually, we can say that the connectivity reshapes the challenges and the complexity of the product design process. I see here four major parts that transforms the new connected device. And that is, for example, the IoT, the impact of the IoT technology brings a new challenge, for example, marrying the physical, the physical world with the digital world. Yes. And I said before, maybe this is the IoT in itself, the connectivity, therefore, in a way you can compare with the Pandora box. It has a lot of advantages, but brings some challenges. There are many things to, to solve. How to incorporate an antenna in an existing product. Then security issues. So marrying a physical object to the digital world have, brings security issues. Should I mention privacy? That's a, another discussion here. But yes, we are going there because there are advantages to have this, even now there comes a, a new trend with the, this, the twin digital to the existing physical object. The other challenge here is always stay on. Uh, you want devices to be always connected to bring data, to report data, or to receive comments from the, from the cloud. So it has to be always on. And some of them are remote devices. They have to live on a battery. That's another set of challenges to have a long life on a set batteries. And we have designs that are, are, are living based on our design data for 15 years on, on a battery. Again, it's obvious now that the other challenge is we move from a single system sitting somewhere in a quote unquote in a corner of that system or of that object or of that machine being part of a huge, large system. Yes. Right now, the machine or the object does not have to behave on its own, but it has to behave according with the entire, uh, the entire system. That's another nice challenge. 
And it's not just that though, right? It's like, that is a disparate data point that doesn't necessarily mean a whole lot in the absence of additional context. The temperature of something like the temperature of a pump operating at a different elevation or operating within a certain climate, these things will have different implications or the vibration or what is it connected to? Is it moving water? Or is it moving tomato soup? You're really hitting a point that I think is that's part of that struggle that we're dealing with in the world of sensing is it's moving beyond just individual data points that we can monitor, but it is now making sense of the aggregate within context. We had a guest, he was talking about the digitalization of workforce knowledge. And it was the idea of the person who's been on the line for 40 years servicing a whole series of different pieces of equipment understands a lot of that context and knows, oh, what you're hearing is a bearing going bad. Whereas the sensor just knows it's getting warm or it's slowing yeah, down. Indeed. And if I may, I have, I have one more point to make here that I yeah, please. Is, is, is equally important. It's an opportunity and a challenge at the same time where this object or machine can continuously evolve in its uses. Because this connectivity brings us the opportunity to change, update, in real time, even the functionality of that, again, object, machine, system, whatever it is. So that gives us the opportunity to make it better, so to speak, by changing the firmware, changing the behavior of the machine based on the data that as a collectivity, the, the system brings data to the cloud and analyze it. And we make, we, we change the entire system. with it. I think that's probably one of the most important parts of recognizing the value of what is built into that world of connectivity is that things get better over time. Granted, there's arguments about phones and planned obsolescence. But that three-year period, my phone actually gets better over time. There's a lot of great examples of industrial Internet of Things applications where designers like yourself built in pieces of hardware that weren't yet utilized, but knowing mm -hmm. it's inexpensive to add it now. Correct. We'll add a dollar thirty-seven to the build of materials, knowing that we can extract hundreds of dollars a month worth of value just by making some remote firmware updates. Yes, indeed. And again, from what this designer perspective, talking about over-the-air updates gives you a bit of peace of mind mm -hmm. because you test a lot. Everything we design and produce, we design after the. At the end of the design cycle, we, we, sorry, we test, 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 test. We manufacture, we test, 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 test. And then you put it in the field and it fails. Not, mm -hmm. not all the time, but it's a different world. But having this quote unquote backdoor in a good sense gives you the opportunity to update that firmware, update that behavior, and gives you a chance of, to make that design, that machine bulletproof for the future. What I'm hearing is that building in the capability for remote access or a secure tunnel for making over the air yeah. updates gives you a lot more flexibility than you had previous to devices being connected. Yes, that it is. And it's one of the crown jewels of the connectivity of this new age. Amen to that. I yes, remember indeed. putting devices out into the car wash industry and before we had remote, had to like hand build remote access to tunnel in and to open up a session and flash firmware, our number one cost that showed up on the overages on expenses was overnight shipping. And most people are like, what does overnight shipping have to do with connected product development? Like <laughs> you put eight devices out that are running eight different car wash bays. And when one goes down, because you're having an issue that you can't diagnose, you have to overnight a new replacement model. You pre-program it, put it in the box, send it out with another label, and they send you back the return so you can put it on the bench and figure out what went wrong. Yes, indeed. Indeed. Recalling units, it's one of the worst nightmares of, a, of any company, let alone a startup. The moment you have a harder component of your, your product, having this secure tunnel for firmware updates can give you peace of mind. Recalling units can just shut off the company, basically. It's a, such, a, such an almost cost for the company to bear that can shut you down. If we're talking about companies, let's think about them as an OEM. They've worked with you to get a piece of hardware designed and 
if connectivity operations is their own understanding of how to deal with security, privacy, digital twin management, analyzing data, remotely accessing the devices, what gaps do you commonly see in OEMs that are newer to connectivity operations to connect the devices? Indeed, we, I, we see quite a bit of gaps because connectivity and IoT as a new technology, it comes with its own challenges. As I was saying before, IoT fundamentally changed the dynamics of our product engineering. We have a new complexity to, to deal with, and not everybody is ready to deal with this new complexity. Speaking about gaps, I think we can talk at two different levels. Uh, the first one is design, a very, very down uh, design level, a harder level even. And the second level is up at the system. Now. When you talk about design, there are a few things that people do not recognize immediately. For example, radio compatibility. Not everybody knows that in different regions of the world, you have di different bandwidth or frequencies that one can use to connect the system to the cloud. So you need a bit of expertise. You need to, to Google quite a lot. You need to learn a lot to, to become the master of this table of frequencies and know who, what to use and where. In fact, you have to use a different modem for different regions of the world and choosing because of this difference in frequencies is not only the modem, but you have to change the antennas. You have to change the matching network uh, in between the modem and the, and the antenna. So there is quite a bit of deep knowledge, harder knowledge that one has to have in order to successfully design connected product that will work in certain parts of the world or even around the world, not to mention that to have a design that works around the world, uh, no matter where you are, you have to make some sacrifices in, in, in many respects from the engineering point of view. The next, there are a few points here. So the first was the radio compatibility. Now the second one is carrier compatibility. Now knowing what seems to use, what SIM cards to use to make the connection again for different parts of the world and. I would like to take a moment here and mention that the eSIM that, for example, Soracom offers brings a huge advantage here. The same SIM card can be inserted in, in each device, regardless of where it goes, it is going on in the world, as connectivity can be provided later. That delivers the single SKU that is so important for operational simplicity, particularly for large international IoT deployments. This makes for simpler, more streamlined manufacturing process and connectivity that uses local networks as local, at local rates. So this is carrier compatibility. It's another piece of information that is missing when somebody decides I want to create my own connected product. Third, certification. And this is a topic in itself. To certify a product, a wireless product, it's not for the faint of the heart or how they say it. It's a very complex process that one has to master in order to pass each and every time. Then you have to add, uh, you have to choose your processors. And today's, there are quite a few processors that one can use from. So use the proper processor for the proper application. It's another skill. Do I choose an overkill? Do I use one that cannot be used in two to five years or two or three, five years? You have to have that knowledge to choose the right processor that will provide the work done today, will do the work today, but also in five years from now, maybe. Isn't that interesting though, that so processors, I've learned a significant amount about the role that processors play in IOT, especially if we're talking security and privacy. Now we need to handle encryption. So now a processor, it's not just a matter of reading the sensor data or running any sort of onboard processes. We now need to handle encryption. And yes. every time we make that processor more powerful, we need more power. And if we're using a battery, then it means it's going to have a shorter battery life. Life, correct. And so it's this vicious cycle. I'm sure there's a great graphic out there of all of the trade-offs. And so the design challenges I've seen is how do we offload some of those aspects? If we can, if the processor doesn't need to handle encryption, but if the SIM can handle encryption, or we're already putting a SIM in, it's already doing the encryption natively. That might mean smaller processor, lower cost, 
less power consumed, longer battery life. Yes, it's, this is one of the challenges of embedded devices. You have to achieve an equilibrium between what is required, what is really required, and for example, the life of the battery. So selecting the processor and without selecting the operating system that runs on that processor, it's a crucial part, it's a crucial element of designing a new connected device. And the processor also will restrict, not a restrict, but it acts as a constraint on which protocols you can effectively leverage. Yes. Indeed. MQTT or HTTPS, yes. TLS. What are the basics that people should understand about that processor selection process? Is there anything specific to connectivity that is general advice? Do you say plan three, four years ahead if you want devices to get smarter over time? I don't think that anybody has, for example, an algorithm that one will, would punch in some parameters and get the name of a processor at, at, at the other end. That's it, fair. It, it, comes it, with, it comes with experience. What we are looking for, what we're truly looking for is the usage of that processor today. Have I maximized the processor time at the process we are doing today? We are, we are deployed, first deployed the new unit, yeah, the new connect, connected devices. Have we, are we at 90% already? Oh, then it's a red flag <laughs> right, right there and there. And with that comes, uh, again, the operating system and the memory usage. Are we using them at a high level, 90%? That is red flag, flag right then and there. It is hard to say that, oh, I should make it at 20% or what is the optimal load for the processor? But 90% for sure is not. We have to understand the customer. You have to understand the market. You have to understand what is the usage of that new device to what we aim for. We, we aim for 15 years, then you better think twice about it. So you mentioned that there was hardware design gaps and then there's system level design gaps. Did you want to cover a couple of those? I'm curious to hear what those might be. Oh. Was there, is there a leading gap <laughs> at that system level design? Oh yes. The one that somehow always comes a surprise and touched already is security. The security is, oh, we need security. Of course we need security. Okay. What can we do now? Sure. This is one of the things that comes as a surprise at the 11 hour. And it should not, because security to be to be fully implemented, it has to be implemented across the board. So it's not the, only at the hardware level. You have to have it in the algorithm, the communication algorithm. You have to have it in the cloud. It's all over the system. But guess what? They want to implement security, and the hardware is not capable to support. It might not have even the, because especially for, uh, for example, uh, monetary transactions, you have to have part of the processor that it addresses only that. <laughs> that encryption, the trust core of the processor. And you don't have it. You don't have it. You cannot implement it after that. You have to go for the design again. So security is one of the system level. It has to be applied at each and every level of the system. I think that the hardest part though, like things that are going to be, if it's going to be a payment processing terminal, like in the States, PCI DSS compliance, mm -hmm. the payment card industry data security standards for those that haven't built these systems in the past, but the PCI, same thing with medical, with a lot of the HIPAA, or even if there's things like high trust or SOC 2 or different targets that you shoot for to either pass an audit or clear mm -hmm. some sort of check. I think what you've just uncovered though, is absolutely true. It's security is an afterthought in industries that are not regulated, where security represents, it's up to them to decide what level of risk is the customer willing to accept? And when you say, so is security optional? I think everyone would say, of course not. It's not optional. Is security <laughs> yes. important? Yes, it's very important. And you go, at what level of security are you committed to? The cheapest level possible. And the, the irony is that, for example, today with the technology evolving so fast, we are able to implement in our new designs encryption and security much, much higher than a bank has today. That's very interesting because the banking industry is evolving very slowly. They have to have certain checks and balances before they go to the next best thing. But the nice part is we, you are able to implement something even more secure than the uh, money transaction. That said, as an anecdot uh, anecdotal, I want to mention that. I thought that it's hard to design and bring to market a medical product because mm -hmm. of all the checks and balances and you have to do. It's nothing compared with a new product that transactions the money from one side to the other. That is even harder. That, that's, that was very interesting to find out.
But you think about the level of, we're in the medical world, it is the percentage of a fraction of a percentage of there being any sort of problem, especially if it's an implanted device or a device that's used in diagnostics, you're at risk of liable. There's a level of liability that could turn into a financial impact. Whereas in banking, we know for certain that crime happens. People are always looking for loopholes. It's no. So it makes perfect sense that our financial, our electronic financial system must continue to evolve because crime is pushing. That is the external pressure at all times is people are trying to exploit systems. So that level of vigilance makes perfect sense. So if security is an afterthought, talk to me about when things like connectivity are treated as the afterthought in the product development process. Yes. Besides security, one thing that we see again and again that people miss at the beginning is certifications. Everybody believes, for example, we have this myth and we believe that I'm using in my design certified or pre-certified modem. Therefore, my design is certified, period. No, this is a myth and doesn't, it doesn't work like that. Once you design the product, having a modem inside, you have to recertify that the entire thing. That's the myth that we have to put out forever. The other mistake that people do is here comes certification. They go full steam ahead. They do the alpha, beta, gamma, whatever they go for pilot. And then they go for certification, which is very late. But why is that? Because they go for certification. They may not pass, especially if it's their first time trying to do that. And then guess what? They have, they are stopped on their tracks. They have to go back to the almost square, square one. They have to go to the, go back to the drawing board and redesign the product almost from scratch. And that takes time and takes resources. That is a very bad mistake to make. And that is one of the advantages working with companies like I, like us, like Neuronic Works, because we have years and years of experience designing your product and from the beginning, which path we take to make sure as much as it possible that you will pass in flying colors. To do that, we have a process that we, at every level of design, we are talking to, we are testing as fast and as many times as possible this new product in different forms, such that we make sure that when we go for the final full certification, we pass. We have connections and we know what it takes, takes for FCC certification for PTCRB and mm -hmm. even UL. So you have to have that knowledge to be able to pass with flying colors from the first go. What I'm hearing you say sounds an awful lot like when I was in the software world, we had a fairly forward thinking QA department where they implemented a program where typically software would go all the way to the point where we're ready to send it off to QA and they would run it through all of the different, the scripts and the test scripts and looking for errors. And they instead took a QA lead and had, they called it integrated quality assurance. And on the project plan, it looked like we were slowing things down or adding to the budget, but by having someone that was even at the wireframe level going, oh, you see what you're doing there? That's probably going to trigger a failure. We've mm -hmm. seen this before. And so each small milestone in the process, they were actually having QA look over the shoulder and ask some of these questions, even before there was enough code to write scripts against. Mm -hmm. And that ultimately made it so you didn't lose all of that time at the end and found that it reduced the actual QA expense by upwards of 60% on a lot of projects. Yeah. Yes. This goes back to the idea of fail, often fail fast. And that implies bringing, talking and testing with the regulatory bodies of your system as many times as possible. And why is that? Because a change at the beginning of design cycle, it's way less expensive than change at the end of the design cycle. As I mentioned at the beginning here, talking, you want to certify a pilot production already. That means you have a production. That means you, you spend a lot of money to bring that production up. If you have to change anything, it becomes unbearable expensive. So yes, test as fast as, as, as many times as possible. I'm hearing fail fast internally. Don't fail fast <laughs> externally. Definitely. That is the point. And I'm sorry, I don't suggest anything else, but 
you have to do that. The, by being scared of testing your product, that doesn't help you. You have to try to test it as many, as many times as possible. So I want to turn to a question that I pinned down. I love hearing what people have to say about this. So I believe that there is no such thing as a neutral brand interaction. So what, what, what and what I mean by that is like the, you either, like you go to a restaurant and it's either a good or negative. They didn't fill my water glass up enough or they weren't really nice to us when we came in or right. It's small, but there's it's just neutral. In regards to what people say about their wireless connectivity buying experience, would you say in general, it's a positive or negative experience <laughs> when they're going and finding the carriers to support their products out in the world? It is hard to define the experience. And because of the complexity, because of the, of how many things one has to keep in his mind, his or her mind for a successful product launch at the end of this effort, because there are so many things I think, so many ways the thing can go, go wrong. Unfortunately, buying connectivity, it's not an easy, pleasant, all time pleasant experience. And it will sound self <laughs> sufficient here or self inflicted or something with self here, but working with companies like Soracom, like Neuronic Works, that we've been around the block a few times, that know what is expected, that know how to direct a customer or direct in the sense of guide a customer through this difficult process, it brings value to the table. So outside of those experiences, though, we, we went through where some of those gaps are. A company like Neuronic Works, you bring to the table, let's make sure we talk about certification. Let's make sure we talk about antennas and processors. And right, you've got your checklist, and it's not just pulling something off the shelf. For so many years, and this is personally, I'm new to the Soracom experience outside of Soracom, going to a big box carrier and just negotiating for cost and coverage. It felt so transactional and there was so little value. It felt like I was insignificant because I wasn't moving a million devices or I'm not buying 10,000 lines of, of, of service. And I don't know that at this point, even 10,000 lines of service gets you more than just, you know, well, you've got one person you can call, but do they have the answers? I'm not really sure. So, you know, for, for people that are, aren't familiar with the SORCOMs and the neuronic works of the world have had to deal with a lot of these other experiences out there. So what would someone at an OEM, like, what do you know of their experience? Where is it that they felt underserved? I don't think I have a story per se here that I can share. Again, for me, it comes back to the challenge in between the I want to go to the market as quick as I can, but I don't know how to do that. And again, as you mentioned, Ryan, I would like to start with a small sample set and therefore I have some thousands of units on, on the road. It is, I believe we, because we've been in their shoes, we are holding their hand all along the way. It's sometime uh, feels going up a mountain. It is that feeling where it's not necessarily a walk in the park to, to make it happen. However, as I said, given the fact that you bring along the way, people that you trust, people that have been there and done that, that can definitely make the experience much easier and more pleasant. Final question. So the doctoral thesis from <laughs> 2003, yeah. what it, what, what would, what would you hear in the future? What would you tell? T2 of 2003 to look forward to. <laughs> More than you expect, <laughs> that is for sure. That was a thesis in basically machine learning that will guide the mobile robot to find its way around. Yes, expect the unexpected thing that more will come. It, it, not necessarily at the movie level, at, the, at, the, at that level, but yes, it's coming step by step and I see that coming and that makes me even more happy. I stayed in my mind with, with this love for machine learning is called now, then it was artificial neural networks. And therefore even the name of the company, it's a, it's a, uh, of our company, it's a game of words, play of words 
because neuronics is that, that part of the brain that creates something new. It's a creation part and the works is the something engineering, the very regimented way to produce something. I'm happy. I'm happy where we are and I'm happy for where we're going because I don't see any slowdown. On the contrary, there is a continuous acceleration of the, of new technologies coming on the market. And we see opportunities at each and every corner, not only for us, for our clients as well. I want to thank you so much for sharing your time, your expertise, and covering all of these gaps that I don't think we always think about. And so this makes a really helpful checklist for someone who is considering the idea that they may have, that they want to bring to market, and how complex some of these decisions can be and what the value of having an expert guide alongside them might look like. So T2, thank you so much. I appreciate everything. Is there any final advice you want to give to those of the future, of the next generation, 20 years from now? I like to steer the, steal the words and of many people and something on the long, along the lines of saying the best is yet to come. Couldn't agree more. Thank you so much, T2. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you for the opportunity. I hope that my views and my, my words uh, can make a difference. And um, we are here to help. Ooh, I got chills after that. I just finished listening to this interview all over again. And I have to say, I just love the fact that we have someone uh, like T2 who is willing to share so much of their past experience and didn't hold anything back. These are the exactly th the types of conversations that we're looking to have on this podcast. So please reach out to T2 on LinkedIn and thank him for his participation. It would mean a lot. I appreciate it. All of our guests, this is exactly the types of thing that we're looking to do, especially for those of you that are new to IoT or currently in IoT and are looking for ways to look around the corner and see what it is that you're missing or how you can improve your own experience, how you can improve your career and what it is that we can all do together to raise the water level in this industry because there is certainly the need as professionals to level up, to improve our game and find ways to overcome what has been a lot of jobs just dropped in our laps. And it's up to us. It's for those of us that have been here, done that, that we need to uh, help make it better for the future generations of IoT professionals. Till next time, I'm Ryan Carlson. Take care.